Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Dog, welcome back to the next session, which is episode 172, where we're going to be looking at diagnosis. Is it useful in counselling and psychotherapy? Or do we well, just willy-nilly go and do what we want to do? <laughs> one of the first books I ever read, uh, I, I don't know when this, uh, is it 86 or 87? Maybe it's one not one of the first books, but certainly in the late 80s, I think. Um, it was a book by Patricia Clarkson, who was a very well-known psychotherapist and very unfortunately took her own life. Um, and I can't quite remember when that was. It was many decades ago, but she was very well known. And also she wrote quite a lot of books. And I, I don't know if this was in a book or an article of hers, but she was discussing, you know, um, what we're going to discuss here. Yeah. Is whether diagnosis is really useful or in fact hindering um, and I think she came out on the favour that uh, diagnosis was not always useful. Um, now, that's really what the podcast is about. Now, all people listening to this will come from different modalities. Yeah. Transaction analysis, gestalt psychotherapy, existential psychotherapy, drama therapy. Um, we could go on and on. Wendy Dryden said there was over 100... Was it a huge number? 615 different types of therapies. I've just mentioned the more well known there ones there. Um, but but according to where you've trained and where you think, um, you've probably had a weekend or at least some training around what we're talking about here. Yeah. Now in transaction analysis, which was my first training for 17 years and was highly influential in my thinking um contractual theory and diagnosis um was very high in the training modules um so in transaction analysis when you think when we you know when we talk about diagnosis we're taught to diagnose through what is called script analysis and there's a whole there's lots of ses ses sessions about ta uh, ways of thinking around oh, I won't go through podcasts and junctions and drivers and early decisions etc etc and as you go further into the training of TA you'll be taught about more of the classical di diagnostic categories in such medical I think they're medically led if you like diagnostic manuals which will have different clusters of you know what makes up somebody who's got a schizoid personality disorder if they fall into these six clusters? Yeah. Um, and there's the, the, I'm thinking of the DSM-5 or the ICD-9. Um, and then that's the diagnosis. So um, that's taught in the TA training as well. So anybody who goes through any TA training thinks will have had a lot of training about how to think diagnostically. And you must have been the same. Yeah, yeah. I was just looking up there. I've got my DSM-5 up there. cost me a flipping fortune. And I can't honestly say that I've opened it that much since I've qualified, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, you've got DSM-10 now, haven't you? Whatever, 11 maybe. Yeah. Um, so, that, so obviously, there's a lot of emphasis in our training. Other trainings, perhaps there isn't such an emphasis on, you know, diagnosing and putting people into boxes and labels and defining. Yeah, I think that it's something that I found that's happening increasingly more and more is people come with self-diagnosis. They diagnose themselves with whatever it is that they come with. Do you know what I mean? OCD or ADHD or autism or whatever it is. And when I say, have you had a, a formal diagnosis? They'll say, no, but I know that's what it is. How do and, they know? Yeah, well, exactly. 
they, they, Dr. Google, I would imagine, you know, I went on Google and I looked and I've got, it says, this is what this means. And I've got all of those symptoms or whatever. And I'm not sure that I like diagnosis. I tell you what really annoys me, besides what you've just said there, lots of people go to Google, is when they go to the doctors, the doctors aren't trained psychologically. Yeah. And they're not trained to give out drugs either. So, uh, but they're certainly not trained psychologically in the training. And yet they, they, you know, almost willy nilly come up with a diagnosis. But I think, you know, people do get some comfort from a diagnosis sometimes that, do you know what I mean? It explains certain behaviours that they have and kind of normalises it somehow and they get a sense of belonging. You know, a lot of mental health issues can be quite isolating for some people. And a diagnosis or a label of something can be quite comforting to some people. Okay, my, okay, ADHD, if you like, one's in my family, and I'm pretty neurodiverse, if you want to use these terms. Um, and, you know, people very close to me come in and say, well, I'm ADHD and medication and all this sort of stuff. Now, I think the real problem, the real problem is when a person makes that diagnosis, whether it's through the doctor, whether it's through Mr. Google, whether it's through whatever, a DSM-5. The problem for me, I, I really hear the other side of it, is what you've just said, is they often define themselves as that type of person. And once you start defining yourself as somebody who's got X, 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 and X, you often live up to it. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. With that is, you stop looking for options. Yeah, of empowerment. Yeah, yeah, and they can be debilitating. What well, you know that that diagnosis, that label, whatever it is, becomes part of who you are. Absolutely. We we when I was a foster carer, we, you know, there was one particular placement that we had that he was diagnosed with ADHD and he was on Ritalin and all this sort of stuff and everything and he wasn't and under under you know cams and everything else we withdrew his treatment we got him off he came from a really chaotic upbringing and that was what caused his behavior it wasn't anything to do with ADHD mm. and it was really okay. important for us that he knew that, you know, this wasn't a defining point in his life, that he had choices on his behaviour, and that was down to him, not anything else. That's right. And we know in the medical field, if you just go over to um, cancer, for example, yeah, or we could, I was just thinking of another per, a friend of mine, um, but if the person, I think people are Western now, to saying XXX, a person may live up to that almost completely. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, mean, it's yeah. like, you know, I've got a cancer diagnosis and they yeah. give you a, a lifespan. Do you know what I mean? I've already exceeded what they said that mine would be because it, to me, it's just a number and it doesn't mean anything. But for somebody that listens and takes that on board, it becomes a reality. Absolutely. You know, I mean, this is close to your heart, I'm sure. Um, that's why I was hesitating a bit to use that. But I do, I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, I mean, don't it, hesitate, it, Bob, because I talk awfully about it. But they right. gave me two years and I've exceeded that now. Do you know what I mean? And I'm probably healthier now than what I've ever been. So it's just a statistic. It's a, it's a number. That's it. That's all it is. Yeah. And unfortunately, and I say it with very sadness in my heart. Some people, uh, I can think of some now, who were given, say, I don't know, 15 months to live. On the 15th month, they then die. Yeah. Or they pass away. Because yeah. that's, they pre programmed themselves. Yeah. And they're counting it down. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's it. They're counting it down. So I'm not somebody who would, I'm not in favor of 
diagnosis like that. No, me you... neither. Not, not way, however. It's putting people in boxes and it's quite rigid in yes, you are, no, you're not. And, and I think we're all unique and individual and we've all got grey areas. Yeah, and now let's move over to a phrase I quite like in some ways and don't like. But at least it's a little, it's more of an option than the, the area of multi diagnosis. Where people say, oh, well, you know, you, you've got some uh, antisocial and passive aggressive, or, and they come out with these phrases. So to escape, if you like, or to attempt to escape a one model diagnosis. And that's a little bit better in terms of options, but I still think people then live up to these diagnoses. The other thing, so that's that side. So you see, I am much more the side against diagnosis, as you can see, <laughs> side, but I think more of your side. But the other thing I think is that, unfortunately, and I think this is really unfortunately, the diagnosis leads the treatment. Yes. So, oh, oh, right. Okay, so the person is paranoid. Right, in the DSM-4, da, 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 and okay, yeah, definitely paranoid. So what's the treatment for paranoid? Oh, I'll go to my book on by Benjamin Smith says, uh, if somebody is paranoid, we need to XXX. And then and there we are. You know, the diagnosis often leads the treatment. Yeah. Now, I think, well, that's number one. Secondly, at least in our training, we were taught automatically, I'm going to go back a long time, I'm sure you were trained automatically, to think of differential diagnosis. So at least we were thinking about difference and what, what these behaviours and processes, though they may look as X, actually are B or whatever it is. In terms of <laughs> I can distinctly remember in my training going through virtually a whole weekend of looking at this diagnosis thing. And it's like, so we've been through this, this and this, and this is the conclusion that we've come up with, that this is what's happening. But it could be the complete opposite of this. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. But I love that because we are unique and we are all different and different things impact us differently. And for me... I feel one way on a Monday morning and I can feel completely different on a Tuesday afternoon and that's okay. I know two very good books. One is called Personal Adaptations by Stuart and Van Joins. They're very good for, well, I don't know, see, I don't think they are that good, but I mean, in terms of structure and thinking yes. about how to yeah, work yeah. certain way with certain classifications for yes. beginning therapists who like therapy by rote, then that's a positive book. But I like them. It's something to hang your hat on and start to explore. Yeah, yeah. What happens when people get more experience, experience clinically, they move away from therapy by rote. Yes, yeah. And they start looking at the person rather than the treatment plan. Yeah, yeah. A great favour uh, of relational psychotherapy. And sometimes these treatment plans and diagnosis means that we don't see the person in front of us. We see the bullet points on page 67 of the book. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've seen certain clients that are desperate for me to give them a label. You know, they, they, they're asking me all the time, so have I got this? Is this something that I've got? And it's like, I, I don't know. A <laughs> well, good question is, if, you, if we do define you this way, and it could be said if we go to DSM-5 or DM-3 or whatever it is, what next? Yeah. You know, it's like, what, what, and, and, yeah, okay, so you're, let's say you're OCD or something, and? Yeah. Does that magically mean somehow that we can go down a path that, whatever? It is. So I understand what you're saying, because I also I spent many, many years with people saying, I would like you to give me a diagnosis and treatment plan. And, you know, um, usually I say, well, 
we could look at it this way. We could even look at it this way. But yeah. if we look at it this way, um, I'd like to have a perhaps a better name for this. So, you know, if you look at somebody who's got a withdrawn personality or is passive or and what does that mean in terms of relationships and options and change yeah. rather than calling them schizoid, for example? Yeah, yeah. And we, we all have these traits in us, but it doesn't mean that we're rigid and stuck in our ways. It just means that we have certain traits. That's mm. that's okay. Mm. Yeah. As I say, in TA therapy, you are trained to think of drivers and junctions and early decisions. So that's diagnostic by definition. Yeah, and I do like that. I, I do like those things to as a starting point <laughs> oh i'm not saying a criticism I'm, I'm, i wanted to say that for beginning therapists most beginning therapists trainee therapists love that way of yeah. thinking because they've yeah. got something to hold hold uh, the hat on yeah and it, 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 that's the educational stuff that i do as a way of explaining things to clients that you know they have a certain understanding of why we sometimes behave the way that we do mm. Mm. yeah mm. yeah and i'd be very surprised if anybody listening to this podcast hadn't got hadn't been through a training or this was some form of diagnosis yeah um, yeah for me, a lot of this is around or labeling at least. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's around self awareness and becoming more aware of how we respond and react to people in certain situations and the relationships that we have. And it, it's not a diagnosis as such. It's just this is kind of who I am, mm. Mm. knowing that it changes. Yeah. If I was to give anybody a diagnosis, I think the one thing that I would diagnose most people with is that they're human. <laughs> oh, that's a lovely sentence. That's it. If they want a diagnosis, then you are 100% human. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice way to look at it. I think it's important to think about diagnosis, treatment plans, um, and therapy by what I call rote, because the I understand the other side of it in terms of freedom, people know what they are and all these sorts of things, and then they can follow the treatment plan and get better. And at the same time, the very things I was just talking about here might mean we see the diagnosis and the treatment plan rather than the person sitting in front of us. Yeah. And as we all know, that the real curative factor in psychotherapy is the relationship then it's uh, an interesting other road we might go down. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, EG, again, it, 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 I think that, you know, the, the podcast titles that you come up with, Bob, are really thought-provoking because, you know, it does wanting to have a diagnosis, whether that's us wanting to diagnose our clients or them wanting a diagnosis, is there something there about structure and having a structure and having, mm. I don't know, boundaries and expectations and things that makes us feel safe? That's right. I mean, you are correct. You are absolutely correct. Most people that come to the clinical room want you to be Father Christmas and to tell them what's wrong with them. And if they do this, this and this, they're going to get better. Yeah. And that's what most people come with. That's their desire even if they don't say it. Yeah. Which ultimately is a diagnosis. That's that's what's at the heart of all of that, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in all the assessments, people come with basically relationship difficulties. Uh, and they, you're right, you are correct nowadays. They tend to diagnose themselves by saying, I've got an anxious presentation, or I'm sometimes depression, or a favourite one, ADHD is another one. Yeah. yeah. And 
they usually do beat me to the gun and i might say where do you get that diagnosis from and what or what does that mean for your life or yeah yeah how does that help you any of these more so we can get a to look at the relationship problems or the developmental deficits or what's the process underneath the diagnosis yes yeah yeah and i think that's really valuable because underneath every diagnosis there is a person yeah yeah so we, that's the real problem yeah uh, my daughter went down that road and she was given medication and in the medical world for adhd and therefore they so we'll we'll monitor you and we'll see if this level of was it written or no whatever it is suits you and then it doesn't and then it does but there's no sense of what's beneath that yeah no sense of you as a person no sense of holism you might well just be talking to i don't know mr a or mrs c or yeah or there's no sense of categorizing people isn't it you're you're that person you're that person you're that person yeah and when we don't know what you are really, we'll put you into this box, mm. which is an unspecified box, but you'll fit into there. <laughs> I think I'm in that unspecified box. <laughs> <laughs> and it's put it in boxes. So, you know, we go down a medical route, but if people come with these things, ADHD, I will talk about how does that affect and impact your life and how where's that come from? Yeah. Rather than yeah. the designated treatment plan on 167 of the ADHD handbook. Yes. Or the anxiety handbook or the depression handbook or the relationship deficits handbook or the, the you know, uh, emotional regulation handbook or something or other. Yeah. I'm much more interested in finding out about their lives. And and I think you, you touched on it earlier on as well, which I think <clears> is really <throat> important. It's often a diagnosis defines who they are or who they think they are as a person mm. yes definitely yeah and that's that's not how we are no so i'm much more interested in finding about out about the person in front of me rather than their diagnosis or their medication yeah uh, well how did you become that way and are your mum and dad still together or split up or got a big family or what's been happening for you in the world and what was like what was it like for you as a teenager and yeah. how come you come to Manchester or do you live by yourself have you got support mechanisms or are you somebody who lacks resources because you live alone or what's it like living in this world at the moment with so much uh, you know a, a, a war in Europe and a war, a war in the Middle East and all this stuff yeah yeah it's much more a personality profile for me. You know, what's it like coming here for the first time? And Absolutely, to me, yeah. All yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's a more interesting and important profile, I think. Yeah. Than following this road system yeah. led by, you know, a diagnosis. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, you know, how does that play out in your everyday life? And what does that, what, you know, limitations does that put in you? But it, yeah, it's just, they're just so limiting. And and I again agree with what you were saying about once we get into that mindset that this is who we are, it's really difficult to get out of that, that mindset. Hmm. So somebody comes and says they've got anxious and I say, oh, and they, and then we're going to go with formulation about the history and everything, how you become that way. And oh, oh, right. My doctor said I'd generalized anxiety. Oh, tell me what's what's brought the two of you to come to that conclusion. And tell me a little bit about your life. And you know, I've never seen a baby born with generalized anxiety. So how does that yeah. XXX? So I'm starting to learn about them holistically rather than page 72 of how you treat, treat somebody with generalised anxiety. Yeah. And then we might get to how come they become the way they are. And we might get to the context of how they made those decisions, even if it might seem quite bizarre to you. If you trace it back, there's going to be a very, very valid reason, which then 
probably, you know, uh, we can look at how, how they become the way they are today, and we can look at how past effects present. Yeah, we are into therapy being a much more relational psychotherapy um, than a diagnostic led one. Yeah, and I love what you said then about looking at the person, you know, holistically, as the you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. It's the whole we tend to separate things out, you know, physically, this is who I am and emotionally, this is who I am. And, you know, educationally, this is who I am where it's, it's the whole everything. Yeah. That's right. So I like my Pilates teacher or my massage person or my, you know, whoever I go to, to think more about other things as well. Yeah. And if I had a therapist, I'd want them to think holistically. Yeah. Because, I, I, I have, I, how can I, I've been seeing the other person actually interested in the whole of me and just not a, what I would see as a limited diagnosis. Yeah, because everything is interconnected. You know, our mental health is connected to our physical health and our physical health is connected to our mental health. And I don't think you can look at things separate from everything else. It's really important. I think the psychotherapist doesn't do that. Yeah. Uh, they really have an emphasis getting to know the person in front of them so they can have a relationship with the person in front of them. Yeah. And look for the um, disruptions in the relationship, which will be the clues to how they um, are today, behaviorally, emotionally, and physically. I think that's why I I like transactional analysis and everything because it is relational. It's it's that's what I like about it. It's not just looking at a book and ticking boxes and this is what you are and this is how you cope with it. It it is relational and it, it's such a grey area. And you know, going right back to the beginning, I can distinctly remember that weekend when I thought I'd nailed it and I understood what this was all about, and then you came into the room and it was kind of like, yeah, but it could be this or it could be that. And it's like, oh no, this is messing with my head now. But it's the exploration and the journey that you go on for me that is the exciting part of it. And I agree. And the curative factor is when you ask questions and inquire about the person in front of you rather than going to page 172 of your therapy diagnostic 101 yeah exactly yeah my opinion yeah i i'm with you 100 percent. and i think mate you know i'm so pleased that i trained at your institute because (laughs) there's so much that i picked up along Mm. the way i did think there were definite answers to everything and i liked that Mm. and i struggled when i realized that there are definite answers to everything you're right that's and clients want that they have a yeah. desire a motivation that if it can come in and somebody said well you're definitely that and if you do this this and this by then you will be better absolutely that's what i wanted what most people want in fact i would like that i was thinking about <laughs> the other day and you know you know when i had my heart surgery and my heart surgeon said right okay get your what, do walking a lot your heart muscles going to get better and be more valid and that do this and do that and do that at a physical level but of course he didn't ask me oh sorry he didn't then end the inquiry about psychological levels what supports i've got what resources i've got yeah. you know because he was thinking physically or medically yeah. and in fact that's what i want a surgeon to do yes and yeah then i saw a therapist ask me all the holistic questions later yeah, because it does, you know, my dad suffered from a heart attack and he massively, massively impacted on him mentally. That's right. He and that's became what fearful support. of everything. Ah, so the, right. the two are connected massively. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have a heart attack, but I had open heart surgery. And it that's four and a half years ago now. I was talking to a masseuse that I've now got who will massage the scar tissue but for, for a long time the fear of um a lot of not well fear of many things apart from yeah. on this podcast so much but um 
they would have never been asked by the surgeon and perhaps that's not the place for, for a surgeon to even ask those things and they've been trained that they think well this is what you do this is what they do absolutely and in all that becomes about a lot of other things and what you just shared there that can impact the life uh, it's not very far here you know, the impact of your life uh, in a quite a psychologically self-limiting way yeah and that's what a diagnosis can do. It limits their life. I think that's a wonderful way of, of putting it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Become self-limiting or can yes. become self-limiting. Yeah, yeah. I just did walking all the time, not had time to um, be able to talk about my own vulnerabilities in other areas. Then what would happen is that I'd probably turn inwards. My options would be limited because... Um, of my feelings of vulnerability or whatever it is, and maybe I might not do X, X, and X. So holism is the way forward. Yeah. To think holistically. But the war, it's all affect, you know, emotions affects behavior, behavior affects thinking, thinking yeah. affects spirituality. And we could go on and on, couldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. It's why I was very, um, you know, really turned on by integrative psychotherapy because the, idea of us all being our different parts of ourselves connected but also connected to everybody else yeah yeah i love, i i definitely yeah thank mm. you bob then another wonderful one yes is it uh, i hope i didn't go on too much about um some of my passions but no, I, I love li I love listening to you and your passions, Bob. So what we're going to talk about next time is what we can learn from the past for the future of psychotherapy. Oh. <laughs> I, do I, do <laughs> I wonder it's very what you're thinking. Podcast, when you come up. <laughs> yeah, I do. That's really that's that's really an amazingly meaty one, but I'll enjoy talking about that. Me too. Until next time, Bob. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.